Today we're going to continue the Bible study on Miriam. And we had an introduction last week. So who can tell me, one, who was Miriam? Moses' sister. Now where did Miriam fall in the birth order of things with the, with the children in the family? You mean age wise? Age wise, yes. Where did she, okay, she was where, where age wise? Well, she was older. Yes, she was the old, oldest. Yes, she was the oldest of the three. So we have Miriam, we have Moses, and who was the third? Aaron, right. Aaron. Now, by way of review, and this kind of went fast last time, there are five women that are credited with saving the life of Moses. Who can give me a name? Five women. Yep, yeah, Miriam, that's right. Miriam is one. Pharaoh's daughter who what? Took the baby Moses out of his little baby basket and kind of fell in love with the little fella and took him home as her own. Who else? His mother, that's right. His mother hid him until he was three months old and she couldn't hide him anymore. Why was she hiding him? Protecting from who? King. Pharaoh, yes, king, the Pharaoh. And remember, they're in Egypt. They're still in captivity in Egypt. And the Pharaoh at that time hated the Israelites. And he decided it was just time to do away with them, so he tried to kill, what, the baby boys. So he was saved by, we've named three so far, there's two more women that were instrumental in saving the life of Moses. In fact, Pharaoh called these two in to talk to them and gave them a demand or a command, and they didn't do it. Midwives. The midwives, that's right. The two midwives that were responsible for helping the birth of the Israelite babies, Pharaoh called and said, when they're born, kill them. And they said, no, they didn't do it. So five women are credited with saving the life of the baby Moses, including his very smart older sister, Miriam. Now, what was her role? What was her role in saving Moses' life? She was one that was hidden and went to, a, I guess it was the king's daughter. Mm-hmm. And told her that she knew. Yeah, take care of the baby, yeah. Yeah, when it came time to put him in his little floaty basket yeah. and send him down the river, Miriam was kind of following along watching to make sure, you know, that little baby brother got someplace and out of danger and he floated right into, what, the Pharaoh's daughter who was taking a bath evidently along the riverside and, and found him and then she suggested a wet nurse for the baby who just happened to be who? The baby's mother. So, smart girl, very smart girl. And we were talking about the rule of, of Israel, that when Moses was called to take the Israelites out of Egypt, that there was actually three people that ruled over the Israelites together. Moses and who? Miriam and Aaron, right. It was kind of a, a family affair that the three brothers and sisters kind of co-shared the ruling of the Israelites. Even though we hear about Moses the most, Aaron and, and Miriam kind of pale, you know, because he's, he's the one that's remembered the most, but they, they were also there. Now, something that my Bible study that I'm reading from here doesn't mention, but is very important, is that Moses, do you recall he had a, I guess you would say handicap? I hope I'm politically correct by saying that. He, he, well, I don't know if he stuttered. Yes, he stuttered. Okay. That's right. He had, he had a hard time speaking oh. in front of people. And, you know, some people thought, you know, stutter something. So Aaron, a lot of time, was his spokesperson because he was, you know, kind of embarrassed about his speech. But, you know, the three of them ruled together by, what did we say last time? That the rulers at that time ruled with force, with might, with armies. But how did Moses and Aaron and Miriam govern the children of Israel? A judges, okay, so how would a judge be different? They would, yeah, they and by, by judge we mean discernment yeah. <clears throat> to, 
to hear a matter and then act upon it. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. They they led by example. By example. By um, one on one. They appeared to truly care about the Israelites. So it was a different form of rule than, say, the Pharaoh at the time, who was all powerful, who possessed armies and all of that. It was a different way with Miriam and Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel. All right. Um, what was one thing that Miriam was very good at? We got a, into it a little bit last time, and I was mentioning that there was a tambourine here last week. Yeah, they wrote a song, and yes, yes, and what her famous song, Miriam's song. Do you recall what it's about? Some big event in the life of the Israelites. Yeah, yeah. After they got over the Red Sea, that they triumphed and they were so happy and they saw what happened to the chariots and Pharaoh's men, you know, swallowed up so that they could get out of Egypt and be free. And that was a pretty big deal because they had been, you know, I don't know how long, centuries, that they had been under the oppression of the Egyptians. As I said last week, making little bricks into big bricks where they had once been honored in the land of Egypt, they had fallen to contempt. And it was just time to go. They left. They were free. And as is the case in a lot of the Old Testament, and we can talk about another two examples here, that when some big thing happened like this, they wrote songs. And it was often the women that wrote the songs after a battle or a victory or deliverance. And I can think of two other examples in the Old Testament where women wrote songs. Actually, in a third one in the New Testament when some big thing happened. It's a little bit off the subject, but it's kind of, kind of interesting that women were major songwriters. Can anybody think of a couple more examples? Deborah. Deborah and Barak, Deborah wrote a song after they triumphed in battle. Do you remember that? That was, you know, a pretty big deal. Okay, now this other example is a little more obscure, but do you remember the story of Saul and David? And Saul was jealous of David and tried to kill him. Do you remember what set him off when they came back to battle, back from battle? <clears throat> Yes, the, the girls came to greet the soldiers coming back from battle and they sang a song that they had written and said, what was it, Saul has killed his, his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands, you know, and that set Nutty King Saul off. But it was a song that the girls, that the women wrote about the victory of the battle. New Testament. A special song that was written that we don't even talk about very much. Hint, it's in the Gospels. I think Matthew, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes, and who wrote it? Another angel sang one song. Okay, do you remember who wrote the song? The song about the birth of Christ? Yeah, Mary, his mother. Mary, his mother, wrote a song. It's in the Gospels. I think, like I said, Matthew, I'm not sure. We can check that out later. But she wrote a song about the birth of her son. So anyway, back to Miriam. Miriam also wrote a song. Um, and she sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he is thrown into the sea. Ritual singing by women was common in ancient Israel. Women sang particular at victory celebrations, going out to meet returning warriors and greeting them with songs which expressed their relief, 
joy, and jubilation at the end of the defeat of enemies. The particular song that Miriam and the women sang may well have been a back and forth chant between the men and women. Um, Philo of Alexandria, who wrote on a contempt contemplative life described Jewish women standing in rows, swaying and moving their arms and bodies in harmony, chanting rhythmical songs together. They accompanied their swaying movements with the metallic jingle of tambourines. We talked about that last time. The other musical instruments that they used were gongs, you know, big gong, harps, pipes, flutes, shofar, which is what? The ram's horn. That's right. Kind of like a trumpet. Also trumpets, lutes, stringed instruments, and lyres. So that would be just really interesting to hear the songs of the day, you know, in the music of the time. But that's what people did back then. All right. The next phase of Miriam's life is called Miriam's Ordeal. This part of Miriam's story described an incident at Hazaroth as the Hebrew people wandered in search of their promised land. So at this time, they have escaped Israel and they're out wandering around the desert, as we know, for 40 years. All right, Miriam and Aaron are upset with Moses. He did two things that they didn't like, and they decided it was, you know, time to confront baby brother and just get this out in the open. Do you remember what two things that they were upset with him about? Yeah, yeah, when I say you'll remember. Yeah, that they were upset with him, you just can't remember why. Yeah, no, that was his father-in-law. Yeah, that was Jethro, uh-huh, which kind of ties into one of the answers here. They were upset about his choice of wife, you know, and Jethro was his father-in-law, so, you know, I would take it that that was this girl's dad. So why were they upset with his choice of wife? Yes. Yes, what is a good Jewish boy like you doing marrying outside the race? And that really bugged him that he didn't take an Israelite for his wife. Who was she? Do you remember what nationality she was? Yeah, yeah. she was a Kushite. Kushite, which would either be an Ethiopian or a Midianite woman. Ethiopian. My daughter works at Kroger in Louisville, and at that same Kroger, they have Ethiopian girls that work there. And my daughter has become very good friends with a couple of them, <laughs> and they had their Christmas portrait taken together. And she was showing us the pictures, and it is very evident from the picture which one is our daughter. <laughs> The girls are black, but they are stunning. I mean, they are just beautiful, but they are dark-skinned. And Moses fell in love with one of these dark-skinned girls and took her to be his wife. And Miriam and Aaron are upset about that. That's one. Second thing they were upset with Moses about. Remember, he's the baby brother. But he what? He seems to be the favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that even though they are in this together and making decisions together, working together, he seems to be getting the play, you know, rather than the older ones. And, you know, maybe a little bit of jealousy here, you know, not liking it, the little brother, even though they're all in this together, he seems to be getting all the glory and the good stuff. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hmm? 
Has he not spoken to us also? Hey. And the Lord heard it and said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. He tells them all to come outside. <laughs> this is in Numbers 12, 1 through 9. Let's just read that because I don't have the whole thing of what I'm reading from. Numbers 12. Numbers is before Leviticus. No, it's not. It's after Leviticus. Okay. Numbers 12. Numbers 12, 1 through 9. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth, including Miriam and Aaron. So perhaps they got a little big for their britches, perhaps? At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out of the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. Uh-oh. <laughs> when both of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. Listen up, you two. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses, for he is faithful in all my house. He's saying, I don't have to do this with Moses because I don't have to get his attention with dreams and visions because his heart is within this house. He is faithful. With him I speak face to face clearly and not in riddles. I talk to the man directly. What I say I say. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak evil against my servant Moses? He said, why are you speaking evil against him? Then the anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, what? Leprous, leprous, like snow, some sort of skin disease. And they talk about leprosy in the Bible, and evidently it can be different forms of skin disease. But, you know, no matter what it is, it isn't pleasant. Aaron turned toward her and saw she had leprosy. I'm going to ask a question. I'm not sure the answer of myself. Why would he pick on Miriam and not Aaron? Why did Miriam come down with the leprosy and not her and Aaron both? Any ideas, Jack? I said, any ideas on why that happened? Why Miriam was struck with leprosy, but Aaron wasn't? Okay. Any guesses? She probably was more to blame than Yeah, that's my guess, because it doesn't really say, but perhaps she kind of, being the older sister, perhaps swayed Aaron into going to Moses? It was a trial of the It was. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I'd want that. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, do not hold us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Aaron says, We are sorry for what we did after he saw Miriam. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. Oh, she must have looked really bad. <laughs> she must have looked really, really bad. So Moses... You know, after the accusations that came from those two, and evidently Miriam was in the lead in this, Moses cried out to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her. He forgave her right on the spot. Remember it said he was a humble man? 
And he didn't hold a grudge between what Mary and the trouble that she was cooking up. You know, another thought is that maybe Miriam thought she should be the head dude. I don't know. It's possible that she should be in leadership because what? She was the oldest. The Lord replied to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? I'm not sure that must have been an ancient custom. Confine her outside of the camp for seven days so that she may be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought back. They didn't leave her. They waited there for seven days until she was healed, and after that the people left Hazaroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. So they didn't leave Sister Miriam. They didn't desert her. Moses wouldn't let him do that. He prayed for her healing, and what? God said yes. Miriam's question, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses, was a profound one. It asked, well, how do we know what God wants? What ways does God speak to us? And who has authority over us? Really, who's in charge here? These questions are universal, asked by people of every place and every era. We ask those same questions today. As leader of the women and sister of Moses, Miriam had an unusually influential position in the community. This made her words and ideas important because they were listened to and they affected many people. This seems to be why her questioning of Moses was followed immediately by what the text calls leprosy, shocking to all who witnessed it, especially her brother Aaron. Of the ten plagues of Egypt with boils and skin sores. This says that may have been what Miriam had. Don't know for sure. Not important at this point. Whatever it was, we know it wasn't good. Miriam's leprosy was interpreted by the people as a dramatic sign that Moses was God's chosen leader and that Miriam and Aaron's authority while still important, was less than that of Moses. We conclude with the death of Miriam, which is found in Numbers 21 through 2. And remember, with the exception of what? Two people, Caleb and Joshua, of the original Israelites that wandered through the desert for 40 years, no one, except those two, not even Moses, was allowed into the Promised Land and that includes Miriam. Miriam with her brothers Moses and Aaron led the Hebrew people throughout the 40 years when they reverted to the nomadic life, searching, meanwhile, for a land where they could settle. The life they led was hard. They must often have yearned for the stability and settled life that they left back in Egypt. We know that to be the case. Do you remember one time when the Israelites were whining and said, oh, if we were just back in Egypt around the campfires... And the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks. Do you know what a leek is? L-E-E-K? Yeah. Yeah, you can buy them at Kroger. They look like a green onion on steroids. I mean, I mean, really, they would look just like a giant green onion. And I don't know if you've ever cooked with them, but they're very mild. Very mild. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. We use them all the time. We got them just, you know, one time just to see what they were, and they're a very mild onion. So, you know, I'm thinking that that was some pretty good stuff. They, you know, resorted back to remembering the things that they used to eat rather than that nasty old manna that they had to go and gather. And, you know, if I ate the same thing every day for 40 days and 40 nights, I might get a little tired of it. Not 40 days, 40 years, sorry. I might get a little tired of it, too, and be wanting melons and leeks and cucumbers. But they had a hard life. You know, they had a hard life out in the desert. Water was always scarce. The food supply was unreliable. Because you remember, man only came down at certain times. And the physical living conditions were rigorous. 
Eventually, these conditions took their toll on Miriam, and she passed away. She died. The Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the last month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Water, water which was a symbol of life, which played a very important role in her life. How? How did water play a huge role in Miriam's life? Moses was put into the water as a baby. Yeah. She saved her brother from the water. She led the song of victory after what? The Israelites were brought through the Red Sea, the water. She died in a waterless place in the middle of the desert. But immediately after her death, God gave abundant water to the people in the form of a spring. Okay, let's summarize. Miriam, sister of Moses and Aaron, she was a leader of the Hebrew women. Miriam's life had been one of service and leadership. She expressed all the robust qualities that are best, courage, ingenuity in dangerous situations, loyal to her family, and a love of music, storytelling, and dance, an intellectual inquiry into questions about authority and social responsibility. And she remains today a role model for both women and men. Thank you.